Uh, well, welcome all of you to um, the, uh, the, the Humanity Center series on Baked In, uh, Systemic Racism Around and Within Us. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome uh, distinguished Professor uh, Brooks to our series. Um, he is distinguished professor of law here at, at USD, the author of more than 100 articles and over 20 books, including Integration or Separation, a Strategy for Racial Equality, Harvard University Press, and Rethinking the American Race Problem, University of California Press, both of which received national book, book awards. He also had two, has two books on reparations, When Sorry Isn't Enough, The Controversy Over Apologies and Reparations for Human Injustice, awarded the uh, Thorsness Prize in scholarship, and Atonement and Forgiveness, a new model for black reparations, which was endowed by the George Gunn Foundation. His most recent books include The Racial Class Ceiling, Sub, um, Subordination in American Law and Culture, Racial Justice in the Age of Obama, both winners of the Thornus Prize in Scholarship. Professor Brooks is also the co-author of four case books and is a member of the American Law Institute and the Authors Guild. And with that, I will turn, turn over our Zoom meeting to Dr. Uh, Roy Brooks. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you, Liddy, for making sure that this uh, goes uh, smoothly. Um, and before I get started, I just want to commend the SBA at the law school for hosting a very informative event last Friday involving the historic debate between James Baldwin and William F. Buckley at Cambridge uh, University in 1965. Uh, of course, uh, Baldwin is a leading intellectual, in my uh, opinion, the leading intellectual on issues of race of the uh, 20th century, and his influence continues to today. Uh, and Buckley uh, was, of course, the leading uh, uh, figure in the conservative movement. Uh, some people say he is the father of the uh, conservative movement prior to uh, Trump. Um, and the debate took place at Cambridge University in uh, 1965. I show that a part of the debate in my classes, uh, particularly my discrimination law and diversity class. And I do it for two reasons. One is because the debate frames the issue of race today in our society. Uh, and the other is because of what happened after the debate. And uh, this was not talked about enough at the uh, last, uh, at the uh, event on Friday, and it sort of dovetails into my talk today. Uh, and what happened is Buckley's transformation during the debate, uh, Buckley was an unreconstructed racist. Uh, and he even wrote uh, an article which appeared uh, in the National Re Review, Why the South Should Win. Uh, after the debate, and I think the general consensus is that Buckley lost the debate. After the debate, uh, Buckley um, went through this radical transformation on the issue of race. Uh, he was a big supporter of affirmative action as a form of reparations. He criticized the New, uh, New York unions for their discrimination. Uh, he even thought that there would be an African American president uh, within 10 years of the debate. Uh, he also uh, did some things with respect to uh, the LGBTQ community all within his Catholicism though. Uh, so uh, the question is, how is it that Buckley went through this transformation and what lessons can we take from that? And what happened is that after the debate, uh, Buckley was taken on a tour of the inner cities of Cleveland, Detroit, San Francisco by the Urban League. And 
uh, he began to, he had an experience with African Americans, which up to that time he could only intellectualize about, uh, something that many uh, people do today. Uh, no experience, but a lot of uh, intellectual observations to, uh, to, to make. The other thing that happened, Buckley sort of continued his education when he hosted the firing line. He started that a couple of years after the debate. Uh, I used to watch it uh, religiously every Friday evening. Uh, and he had as his first guest, uh, James Farmer, as one of the the top civil rights leaders were among the four top civil rights leaders of the 1960s. Uh, and on his show, he, uh, more than any other talk show on the on TV at that time, he hosted African Americans who were considered to be too radical uh, to be on TV. So he had, for example, Huey P. Newton and uh, Bobby Seals of the Black Panthers. He had Louis Farrakhan on of the, the Nation of Islam any number of times, and that's how he became. So I, I think that with what I take from that and what I'd like students to take from that is the notion that people can be educated, uh, but they have to be individual individuals of probity and intelligence. <laughs> and Buckley was educated. Uh, and I, so I think that that's an important uh, a point to, to take. The other thing I should note about Buckley is that he wrote uh, about 36 uh, novels, mainly spy novels, but he said that he hated writing. Tom Clancy, also a prolific writer, said that writing is the worst occupation, worst profession to have. And uh, so and I, I sort of uh, understand what they're saying. <laughs> Uh, and so you sort of wonder them, why is it that they continue to write? What? And I guess it's sort of like um, the, the, the person, the guy who complains to the doctor that uh, his brother thinks, he says, doctor, doctor, my brother thinks he's a chicken. And so the doctor says, well, why don't you turn him in? And he says, well, I can't turn him in because I need the eggs. And so <laughs> we all need the eggs, I guess. Okay, let me turn to the matter at hand here. And that is systemic racism in the context of law. And let me say right off the bat that judicial decision making, especially at the Supreme Court level, is a major impediment to racial advancement in, in this country, a major impediment to racial ad advancement. The problem is one of juridical subordination, one of juridical subordination. Juridical subordination describes judicial decision making, especially at the Supreme Court level, uh, that inhibits or freezes racial advancement by suppressing the Black equality interest. Now, most civil rights uh, scholars, especially the young scholars who use uh, my, who teach from, from my books, uh, tell me that Professor Brooks, you know, that's you, you, what you're really describing there is systemic racism. Quite a, uh, a, apart from the fact that uh, the, there may not be a racial animus. So, uh, there's, so there's systemic racism despite the absence of a racial animus. The argument that is being made is quite powerful. The argument is that the results are the same regardless of the perpetrator's state of mind. Indeed, Justice Ginsburg made a similar point over and over again, uh, where she says, look, take your damn foot off of my neck. I don't care about your state of mind. Uh, remove your foot. That was her argument. And that's the argument that they are making. So systemic racism is all about impediments to racial advancements, impediments to racial advancement. My argument is that one does not need to establish a nefarious mindset as a predicate for moving against 
impediments to racial advancement. We can assume that the perpetrator's state of mind, such as the Supreme Court, is non-nefarious. We can make that assumption and we would be correct. Uh, two of the justices who routinely come out on what I would argue is the wrong side of racial progress, in fact, believe that they are promoting racial progress. I've known Thomas and Alito since law school and they are not racist, but they are not off the hook. That's the point, they are not off the hook, they are on a different hook. And here's the kicker, the liberal justices on the Supreme Court are also not off the hook. Whether conservative or progressive, the, uh, the Supreme Court's racial transgression, its contribution to systemic racism defined as impediment to racial advancement uh, has a name. And that name is juridical subordination, juridical subordination. So juridical subordination is part of the court's normal operating process. It's what it does. That is why it is important, I think, for students and scholars to think outside the box when studying received traditions of racial uh, justice, systems of racial justice, whether legal or non-legals, alleged systems of racial justice. So our thinking about complex issues of race, identity, and the forces that give shape to our uh, socio-legal order must be critical, must be critical, critical but respectful. So what I wanna do uh, this evening is to simply describe juridical subordination, describe juridical subordination. Understanding the black equality interest in civil rights law is central to understanding uh, juridical subordination. That interest was first articulated by the Supreme Court and Brown versus Board of Education decided in 1954. Brown versus Board of, uh, Board of Education is the most important civil rights case ever decided by the Supreme Court. In overturning separate but equal Jim Crow, the Brown court embraced a vague concept of the black equality interest, namely formal equal opportunity, formal equal opportunity. And for the next 20 years, the Supreme Court as well as Congress fashioned two potentially conflicting norms that gave meaning to formal equal opportunity. What does it mean, formal equal opportunity? Uh, and these two norms are racial omission and racial integration, racial omission and racial integration. These norms define the Black equality interests ordained in Brown versus Board of Education, which in turn guided the Supreme Court as well as Congress in promulgating civil rights laws for African-Americans and other protected classes such as women and Latinx uh, throughout the civil rights years. That is to say throughout the 1950s, 60s and much of the 1970s. The central, the central question today is this, do the conventional civil rights equality norms, racial omission, racial integration, racial omission, colorblind, do they continue to have currency in our post-civil rights society? not just for African-Americans, but for other outsiders as well. Have they themselves become instruments of juridical subordination? 
So let me begin with the civil rights years, which are roughly uh, 1954 to 1972, wherein the uh, court and Congress sought to uh, define the racial omission and racial uh, integration norms. Racial omission uh, defines the black equality interests as racial uh, race neutrality. The government's stance on matters of race should be colorblind. The government policies and practices uh, must be colorblind. The government must take a neutral stance when it comes to matters of race. Racial integration defines the black equality interest as racial mixing. All aspects of the government and government supported programs and activities should be racially mixed. Educational, economic, social activities. Integrated, inter integrated uh, settings produce opportunities uh, for Blacks, for African Americans, and also remove all of the vestiges of prior systems of racial oppression. The racial integration norm is permissive. The racial um, omission norm is mandatory, at least in the way in which the Supreme Court uses them. Government entities do not have to take affirmative uh, steps to promote racial mixing, but they must take affirmative steps, steps to make sure that their programs and activities are facially neutral. That's how the, the Supreme Court sort of looks at it. Both norms, of course, presuppose desegregation. Racial omission and racial integration are potentially conflicting norms. And you see this in cases like affirmative action. Uh, affirmative action typically promotes racial integration in a race conscious manner, a manner that contravenes the racial omission norm. But the norms do not have to, have to uh, collide. Uh, so a colorblind decision making can support racial integration when it eliminates segregative conditions, whether they are de jure or de facto, uh, and thereby allows integration to take place rather organically. But when they collide, something has to give. And the way the Supreme Court has it, the racial omission norm trumps the racial integration norm. Now, there are myriad civil rights laws passed during the civil rights years constructed on Brown's foundation of um, the Black equality interest, formal equal opportunity, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, 1965 Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act of 68, and the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Act of, of uh, 72. Now, here's the problem. The racial dynamics have changed a lot, not a little, but a lot since the civil rights years. They've changed. Thus, the old norms of racial omission and racial integration may not work anymore. Racial conditions since the end of Jim Crow are very different from what they were during the days of Brown versus Board of Education and also during the days of Martin Luther King. The Supreme Court in 1954 was dealing with a system of American apartheid. Blacks in the South were prohibited, not only from attending the same schools as, as whites, but also from uh, drinking at the same water fountain, uh, going to the same restaurants. Um, uh, uh, even the public restrooms were segregated. Uh, and Black officers could not command white troops during the Second World War. Very different society than what we have today. Blacks could be lynched uh, for such infractions as uh, registering to vote 
or filing a lawsuit against a white person or looking at a white woman called, quote, eyeball rape. So in 1972, thereabouts, uh, the racial dynamics in American society changed for the better. Though racial, in uh, racial inequality was still alive, Jim Crow was dead. With the passage of the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Act of 1972. Blacks have also experienced unprecedented individual success, even though capital deficiencies, financial, human, and social capital deficiencies continue to overwhelm the vast majority of African Americans. The problem of Black inequality in our post-civil rights society can be visualized in the following allegory, the allegory of a, of a poker game. So you have a game of, of poker between two individuals, one white, the other black. And the game has been in progress for some 400 years. And during this time, one of the players, the white player, has been cheating. And at the end of 400 years, the white player stands up and announces, okay, from this day forward, no more cheating. Everything's going to be equal. And the black player says, that's great. I've been waiting 400 years to hear you say that. But let me ask you, what are you going to do with all those poker chips which have accumulated on your side of the table? Ah. Given the reality of the maldistribution of the poker chips, many civil rights scholars have called into question the Supreme Court's continued reliance on the racial omission and racial integration norms. Although formal equal opportunity was seen as, as, a, as a revolutionary re response to Jim Crow, today, the vast majority of civil rights scholars questions its soundness in this post-civil rights society. Some scholars, however, do continue to believe that formal equal opportunity, racial omission and racial integration alone provide the best strategy for pursuing racial advancement. And what I've done over the years is I've sort of synthesized the views of these competing claims into four distinct responses to the question regarding uh, uh, formal legal opportunities uh, utility uh, in civil rights discourse today. And these four uh, post-civil rights theories uh, are uh, traditionalism, reformism, limited separation, and critical race theory. So I just sort of synthesize these. They're sort of out there and I brought them together and, and try to clean up a lot of what's in uh, uh, critical race theory. And these positions are fully explained in the racial glass ceiling, uh, which was published, I think, in 2017 at Yale University Press. And then uh, the Racial Justice in the Age of Obama, which was published in 2009 uh, by, by Princeton University Press. So I only have time to sort of sketch the contours of these uh, four uh, 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 postulations. And so let me, let me go through them rather quickly. Traditionalists are largely conservative scholars who believe that race no longer matters in our post-civil rights society. Uh, they believe that formal equal opportunity is conceptually sound, provided that the racial omission tenant trumps the racial integration norm, as it usually does. Now, you have to be careful because there are many races who try to come in flying the flag of, of racial omission. Okay, uh, the traditionalist flag, but you have to be careful there because they are racist and they are not uh, what I would call a traditionalist. Reformists are loosely tied to the liberal side of the political spectrum. And they believe that race still matters in our post-civil rights society. 
and you see Justice Sotomayor in some of her opinions, she'll say race still matters. Formal equal opportunity reformists would argue is conceptually sound, but operationally flawed. It is operationally flawed uh, because the racial integration tenet is typically subordinated to the racial omission tenet. And both traditionalists and reformists believe that they are racially progressive in the sense that their that their positions offer the best strategy for moving forward in terms of race uh, in our post-civil rights society. Now take traditionalism for example. And again, I have to caution, you gotta be very careful about tradition because there's a lot of racists who sort of come in under the traditionalist banner. But a true traditionalist, for example, would argue, believes, look, wrongly, I, 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 as I, would, would argue that race no longer matters in our society and that in any event, race conscious measures are, race, are socially divisive. We don't wanna deal with them. Now the black traditionalists make the additional argument, which I think is a stronger argument. And that is that special treatment under, undercuts the claim of racial equality because such treatment portrays African Americans as, as hapless victims in need of special treatment. How insulting is that? Now, this is the argument that Clarence Thomas consistently made when he was a law student at Yale Law School a long time ago, and which he continues to make uh, in his judicial opinions. The limited separatists and critical race theorists disagree with the uh, traditionalists and reformists claim that they are racially progressive. To understand the inadequacy of the racial omission norm, the limited separatists and critical race theorists would argue, one need only consider Justice Harlan's dissenting opinion uh, in defense of the racial omission norm uh, in Plessy versus Ferguson, his decision which was decided in 1896. When I was a student at Yale Law School, my professors threw that up that this is the way, this is the gold standard here. Um, Harlan assured the nation that, the, that America's racial order would not change under a colorblind constitution. And indeed it has not. So limited separatists in particular argue that the black traditionalists, and there are many out there, are too concerned about making whites comfortable. Too concerned about making whites comfortable. And I attended a session with, a Zoom session with one a couple of the, a few weeks ago and it's, that argument, I think, has a great deal of validity, the limited separatist argument there. So limited separatists and the critical race uh, theorists offer oppositional outside of the box strategies for achieving racial justice. Limited separatists proceed from the normative position that racial identity, racial solidarity matters most in the pursuit of racial advancement today. The best place to find a helping hand is at the end of your own arm. Thus, they believe in strong black institutions that do not underscore, do not exclude whites or any other group. They say, this is the best path forward. So black, the black church, uh, historically black colleges and universities, black schools. Again, there is no racial exclusion there. If you go to Howard University, Morehouse, you're gonna see white students all over. They say, yes, come in, but you, you can come in, but you can't change the software. You can't change what we do, what our mission is. So, so the limited separatists would argue that formal equal opportunity is problematic because it leaves no room for racial solidarity or identity. 
Uh, and therefore it is conceptually unsound. So racial solidarity goes against the racial omission norm, right? Because it's race conscious. It goes against the racial integration norm because it, it believes in uh, racial uh, isolation. One way to understand limited separation, which is a very controversial outside of the box way of thinking about uh, racial uh, advancement is to think of it as the sort of the intellectual side of jazz. Jazz has been described as unapologetically black, yet non-exclusive. Critical race theorist core post-civil rights stance is that white hegemony matters most. Formal equal opportunity protects and per perpetuates white privilege. It offers no social transformation. And for that reason, formally, formal equal opportunity is conceptually unsound, dead on arrival. Formal uh, equal opportunity, the critical race theorists will argue, has given us uh, all kinds of horrible cases coming out of the Supreme Court, among which are cases which protect de facto school segregation. We just talked about these cases in uh, my class this afternoon, one case after the other. Milliken won, many scholars believe it's, some of, it's, it's one of the worst uh, case, it's probably outside of Dred Scott and maybe one other case, it is the worst case that the Supreme Court has decided in terms of social justice, promoting social justice, many scholars would argue. Uh, the Supreme Court, the critical race theorists would argue, given us cases that permit discrimination against black hair. And uh, the, the Supreme Court threatens uh, the existence of affirmative action, the most powerful engine for reconstructing white privilege. So, uh, and, and I understand what, what they're saying because there's a lot of evidence of this. So for example, in racial justice in the age of Obama, I have about a half dozen charts that show that during the heyday of affirmative action, which was about the mid 1970s, which was pre baki the college participation rate for black in brown students, especially brown students, was actually higher than the college participation rate of whites. Actually higher, slightly higher, but still higher. And, and that racial advancement took place without depressing the participation rate of white high school graduates. In my view, our understanding of systemic racism within and outside the law should be attentive to the diversity of core post-civil rights commitments to racial advancement and their concomitant sub subordinated effects. We have to take in a diversity of thinking or concepts what matters most, and I think here I'm going to call upon the George Floyd metaphor, what matters most is for the Supreme Court to take its knee off the collective neck of African Americans. And I think with that, I will stop and we'll go to Q&A if anyone has any questions. I actually wanted to get your opinion on something. I know that they just reversed it a few hours ago. I was reading about but that school in, I believe it was Utah, who was giving its uh, students options to opt out of Black History Month or to opt out of, of this information. Um, I think they just reversed that decision recently, but I wanted to get your opinion on whether, you know, it, it, in response, it, should, it would be appropriate to opt out of white history or whether, you know, some, what, what's your opinion on, on the fact yeah. that they would even offer that in the first place? Yeah, what I would do if I could, and I would probably bring Bill 
Buckley out of the grave and <laughs> let him answer that because you miss it out. I mean, we get white history. That's there. That's the default history. Okay. And we do need to have a, I, I think students do need to know African American history. And I, I can't tell you, and, uh, and some of the students know this because I, over the years, I've had any number of students come into my classes, my civil rights classes, and with the thought that slavery was actually good for African Americans. It did a great thing for African Americans. And they were actually taught that, okay? And those are actually the students that I want because I want to go through this sort of education, this transformation that Buckley went through, okay? No, I think that that's wrong. I think it's stupid. I think it is politically motivated and you know how what I think about politicians, I don't particularly like them. Uh, and so I, I just think that that it does not bode well for our for the future of our society to have these individuals who don't understand uh, who walk, walk around with a lot of disinformation about African Americans and about the race problem. Race problem is difficult enough to 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 comprehend. And if you are not studying it at all, uh, then that 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 doesn't bode well for for the future of our society. I'll ask you a question. Um, you kind of talk about this in our class a little bit, um, but just there's a series of cases that kind of lead up to Brown and, and how we finally get there to the point where even racial omission and integration come up and they become part of the conversation. Um, so if you could just touch on like the motives behind Brown, how we got there and um, you know, like why we finally started taking even that little bit of an approach. Yeah, that is sort of controversial. Um... And uh, there are people who have talked about that, like Derek Bell in particular. And there are the, the received tradition or view on that is that Brown was done for alt altruistic reasons, that the that there was kind of a, a racial epiphany on the part of these uh, Supreme Court justices. Uh, there were studies done by sociologists in the 1940s and all that talked about uh, racial uh, injustice in our society, that sort of thing. But I think that the, the, the better view, and that is the view of, that Derrick Bell has pushed uh, a lot when he was alive, and that the Supreme Court swung in that direction for materialistic reasons. That is to say, uh, there was a amicus brief filed by the State Department that indicated that the that the uh, the country's adherence to segregation uh, had a negative impact on the State Department's ability to do its job uh, in international affairs because you had the communist country saying, "Hey, look, this is what." democracy will get you. Okay, you see what's going on uh, in the United States. You see what's happening to uh, black people. This is what democracy and what the United States has for you. And so for the first time in that case, you had the uh, government uh, siding with the, uh, the, the, the plaintiffs in these, uh, these desegregation cases, these school desegregation cases. And so I would agree with, with Professor Bell that Brown, the impetus of, and the, the real force behind Brown was materialistic as opposed to being altruistic. Another question for you, Professor Brooks. Oh, okay. Um, I'm wondering if you could maybe compare what you think the, the most common norm uh, the Supreme Court takes uh, right now, or that you think it would take, as opposed to what the general population, um, what norm they're most interested in at the moment? Uh, yeah, I, I think that if we assume that the country is split between, you know, racial omission and racial integration, uh, this I can tell you that the Supreme Court is not. Uh, there are justices on the Supreme Court, most of the justices, you know, six of them, uh, are uh, squarely behind the racial omission norm. There's no doubt about that. Uh, they are, uh, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito have already said that they're gonna overrule the Grutter case, uh, the case which allows for affirmative action in higher education on the basis of the diversity uh, rationale. Uh, 
Uh, but Thomas, though, is is a limited separatist in the education cases, uh, and and, um, and there, there are a number of there are at least two scholars that I know of uh, who are writing books on Thomas, and they're zeroing in on on his views on race here, and and, and at least two of his opinions, Thomas says out in the open, he says substantive, it never ceases to amaze me how uh, judges think that anything that is black is inferior. Wow, <laughs> you know, with radical, this is, yeah. And it reminds me of this guy who's at law school. Yeah, this was him. Yeah, he said, right in his opinion, you know, he is a limited separatist when it comes to questions of, of, of education. And he's in favor of black schools. He has this long defense, uh, uh, um, uh, dissent in the parents and Bob case, in which he goes on and on, citing lots of social science data showing that black schools are effective uh, engines of education. So, yeah, I mean, no, the, the racial omission tenant uh, is supreme at the Supreme Court, no doubt about that. One thing that you have said both in this presentation and in our class is that racial subordinators are not off the hook, but on another hook, um, different from uh, racists. But for me, when I see um, people, so from, from your point of view, I, I definitely understand not wanting to shame people and if they are truly interacting in good faith, teaching them, but how would you approach talking to people who say, oh, well, I don't, I'm not racist. And even when you say, well, you're engaging in racial subordination, all they hear is, I'm not a bad person. I don't have the negative intent. I don't have to do any work. I don't have to change in the way I think or the way I do or operate or anything. I think first you have to decide whether or not the person you're talking to is a person of probity and intelligence. Okay, if they're not, you know, the good thing though, if you're in a, a, a university, uh, all the students are here to learn. Okay, so I, so they're teachable. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. It's when you get outside of the the university, uh, you know, venue. That's when you have problems. That's when it becomes more difficult uh, to determine whether or not I'm going to spend my time and an emotional capital dealing with this person because some person you just can. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so what you do, you just have to bring them along. You, if they again, if if there, there's integrity and intelligence there, you bring them along and uh, you have to have, uh, and, and this is where Buckley is so instructive, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's a process of it's education, which is a pro process. And so it's a, it's a question of bringing forward the right information, you know, and non filtered, non-political, non-politicized information uh, and having th this exchange. Um, and what I love, like in, in my classes, uh, especially my jurisprudence class, I love, I get a person from the Federalist Society and then a, a person is very progressive and I spot them early on in the semester. And uh, and then I buy them coffee. I said, go on to have a series of talks, you know, and, and, and my experience has been, if you give people, intelligent uh, people, people with integrity, the same information, they pretty much come to the same conclusions, okay? They pretty much come to the same conclusions, not entirely identical, but they're moving in the same direction. Okay. Thank you. Any other students have questions? If you have time, Roy, I have one myself. Oh, absolutely. Yes. When you, when you say um, Jim Crow is dead as of this or that date, um, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I mean that the government's um, 
the, the government's <clears throat> sanction, the government's imprimatur for uh, uh, racial discrimination against African Americans in particular. That uh, so, for example, you have the I, I look at 1972 because that's when the Equal Employment Opportunity Act was passed, and in that act, for the first time, Congress said that state and local governments can no longer discriminate on the basis of race. Okay, so on the books, okay, and I'm always careful to say, even though Jim Crow was dead, racial inequality is not. We still have racial inequality because ending Jim Crow does nothing to repair the damage done over the centuries uh, based on race. Again, it's about the maldistribution of the poker chips. Uh, and so, yeah, so when I say that Jim Crow is dead, I just mean that legally, uh, you can't discriminate on the basis of race, but it doesn't mean that racial inequality is dead. Racial inequality is alive and unfortunately well today. Yeah, I mean, as I asked that question, I was thinking about how all across the land and across the states right now, uh, Republican administrations are beginning to start up the voter suppression laws. But of oh, course, yeah. those are never phrased as race. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it's there. And again, it's the the, the, the the perspective of the traditionalists is that, look, you know, we don't want we, it's, it's the, the, there's a problem. The, tradition, the traditionalists say we, there is a problem of race here. They don't deny that there's a problem of race. But mm -hmm. their view is that because the government no longer legislates racial discrimination, that any problem of race is due to the internal problems of African Americans, okay? Uh, that sort of thing. And they point to like black on black crime and that sort of thing, but they neglect to, to show that white on white crime is the same percentage as black on black crime. People commit crimes in the areas in which they live. I guess I have two questions for you. One is, um, I wanted to see if you could do if you could sharpen the distinction between critical race theorists and the I guess the people that you're calling reformists and let me just start by saying that as I hear you that reformists are part of the way there but that they are not sufficiently attentive to structural racism to recognizing that there's been 400 years of cheating and that that has to be dealt with. Is, is that a fair? Uh, yeah, that and a little bit more. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's, um, I'll give you an example. If you take a case like the Fisher case where the Supreme Court allows for the use of race in college admissions, okay, the opposed yes. rhetoric. Uh, and if you look at the um, reformists, they will accept that. They said diversity, that is a good reason for uh, having uh, affirmative action. That is a great, that's a good predicate. The critical race theorists will say, uh-uh, that's a terrible predicate because what it does is it distracts from the real reason as to why we have to have uh, uh, affirmative action. And by the way, the limited separatists would say, yeah, that's, that's horrible because what it suggests is that uh, a black person needs to capture a white person in order to get a, a quality education. And I could see Justice Thomas saying, <laughs> this, um, uh, even in his sleep, okay? Uh, and um, the, uh, uh, and, and also I think the limited separatists would say, I might as well add this so, since I'm on the topic, they would say that what the Supreme Court needs to do is to make sure that it does not undermine uh, the legitimacy of historically black colleges and universities. It needs to say something, you know, because in these affirmative action cases, the suggestion is, well, these historically black colleges and universities are not adequate, okay? Uh, and, you know, the way that I think about critical race theory versus reformism is that critical race theory is sort of reformism on steroids. Uh, they want the same thing, you know, they want, you know, sort of mix in. Uh, but the uh, critical race theorists want mixing 
done not on the terms of insiders. You know, uh, reformists are just happen to have a black person there, okay, even though there's no voice there, but you're there, so, you know. Uh, and so the critical race theorists say, no, what we need to have a social transformation. Um, whereas the reformists are concerned with equality, the critical race theorists are concerned with equity. Equity. Are concerned with what? Equity. In other equity. Words, equity. They want to change. They don't want just equality. They want equity. They want to change the furniture in the room. They want to restructure uh, the society. They start off from the with the uh, assumption of anti-objectivism, meaning that society is slanted in favor of straight white males, and so we got to go in and do radical change. Uh, so they are just much more assertive about this and this notion everyone's talking about systemic racism well the critical race theorists were talking about that for a long long time and a lot of their things are sort of coming to pass now the, the other thing that i was thinking um that a traditionalist might say about um diversity is is that of course you're using the black folks to educate the white folks too um which itself uh, is yes yeah, yeah. Uh, but they don't, yeah, but, but they don't, but they would allow it to happen under racial mission. Uh, yeah. 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 So my second question is where you would sit your, situate yourself and where you would situate your call for reparations. Oh, Thanks. oh, golly. I mean, you know, I, I am so non committed when it comes to this stuff because you know I have to teach it and I don't want to seem like I'm taking sides that I to be honest with you I really don't know where I am <laughs> uh, I, I really don't uh, in terms of reparations though I do know where where I am there and there I am in favor of uh, what I call the atonement model that's kind of my contribution to the discourse on reparations and there uh, it, I'm not at all concerned about compensation. Uh, I'm concerned about the I, I, I reparations program, which is not backward looking, not victim focused and not compensatory, but one that is forward looking, perpetrator focused and restorative. So what I like is uh, rehabilitative reparations, which are community asset building reparations are not in favor of giving individual money to uh, the the victims uh, of uh, slavery and Jim Crow today, the so-called compensatory reparations, because I've, I'm in, I, I, I'm in several international study groups. Before COVID, we would meet all over the world. And what I got from the attorneys who represented the victims in, uh, in South Africa at the fall of apartheid is that money given to individuals, uh, one year later, these individuals were poor again. So I just don't see it that way. Uh, I should mention though that my really good friend, uh, Sandy Darity, who's a professor at Duke, he disagrees with me. Uh, and he has a strong argument because he says that individuals should receive money because otherwise you're denying agency to them. Uh, and so th th it's, a, it's a tough argument. And I recognize that on both sides, you can go, there are good arguments on both sides. And that's all I do. I just, you know, this is why I'm not com committed. I, I just, and always in sort of the, the educational mode. And I just want to look at the issues on both sides. I'm glad I could never be a judge because I would never know how to decide. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Brooks, for coming. It's been an honor to have you here. Well, thanks.